fair warning, this nugget is going to be gigantic because really understanding how spanning tree works, we're going to have to take it one step at a time. The good news is, is that at the end of the day, spanning tree really only has four steps involved with it, determining who is the root bridge, then finding out who has root ports, then finding out who has designated ports, and then lastly, who is going to be blocking their ports. It all comes down to starting with the root bridge, then going through the different phases of ports that we actually need to configure in order to find out how spanning tree is going to forward or block traffic. So in this nugget, we're going to take a look at it one step at a time using all of those key terms we picked up in the last nugget to determine how a spanning tree topology would actually work at the end of the day, and maybe a little bit on how we can configure it as well. Or at least we'll set that up as we jump into the next nugget when we start to talk about Juniper's main implementation, which is rapid spanning tree protocol. Let's get going. So now we're going to talk about how Spanning Tree does what Spanning Tree does. And I want to tell you this right now up front. This is actually really cool because Spanning Tree Protocol does it pretty much the same way, regardless of which version of Spanning Tree Protocol you're running. So if you're running the classic Spanning Tree Protocol or Rapid Spanning Tree Protocol or Multiple Spanning Tree Protocol or VLAN Spanning Tree Protocol, the elections and the determinations are still all the same. What really changes from one of those protocols to the next is how quickly it does what it does across which VLANs does it do what it does and how does the configuration really group together some of the different variants. But still, Spanning Tree Protocol protocol is spanning tree protocol and what we're about to learn in this nugget of how it works is kind of consistent from one version to the next. So let's just dig into it. The first things first, in order for host 11 to ping host 12 and make that frame go consistently through the network, the first thing these bridges have to do is they have to elect the root bridge. Now how does the election of the root bridge work? When configuration BPDUs are sent out all of these interfaces down the trunk ports, for the most part, they contain two important bits of information. A priority dot MAC address. That's right. It is literally written like that. Priority MAC address. Now, by default, all of these switches sets their priority to 32,678. Then it's followed by the base MAC address, which is baked onto the device at the time of being manufactured. As each one of these switches receives BPDUs and compares it to their own BPDU, they're going to evaluate who has the lowest priority first, and if all of the priorities are the same, which is the default, then they'll evaluate who has the lowest MAC address. At the end of the day, the combination of this priority and MAC address is called the bridge ID. Very important to know. Now you see up here, I've got this VLAN in question mark. That's because in some flavors of spanning tree protocol, specifically VLAN spanning tree protocol on Juniper devices, they tack on the VLAN number on top of that. They actually add the VLAN to the priority. So for VLAN 10, if the priority was by default 32,678, we add 10 onto that and it becomes 32,688. Again, that's only an issue on VSTP. By default, Juniper devices out of the box run RSTP or Rapid Spanning Tree Protocol, something that we're going to talk about in the next nugget a little bit more. The LAN number really doesn't play a factor in this at all. For the most part, in an RSTP environment, the only thing that plays in here is the priority and the MAC address. So if we know that by default, the priority of all of my devices is 32,678, we can now look at these MAC addresses here to determine who is going to have the lowest MAC address. And this one is actually kind of tricky when you look at it. They all start with 02058671. So the next little 16-bit block that we care about is right here. And the lowest MAC address is right here VQFX5 with this little 1-1 one, one set. So without changing anything else, all of these devices will send out configuration BPDUs out all of their trunk interfaces, and VQFX5 would say, my bridge ID is 32,678, 32, oh, put the dot in the wrong place, dot, then this MAC address right here. So VQFX4 would receive that BPDU, and it would say, oh yeah, your BPDU is better than mine, therefore... From my perspective, VQFX5 is the root bridge. Then VQFX4 would send its BPDU to VQFX3 and VQFX2, and it would say, my root bridge 
is VQFX5 and it costs me 2000 to get there because that 10 gig ethernet link that it costs for QFX4 to reach QFX5 is worth a cost of 2000 From there, VQFX3 and VQFX2 would exchange VPDUs this way towards each other as well as VQFX1. And they would identify my root bridge is VQFX5 way over there. And our cost to reach it is 2000 plus 2000. So their cost is 4,000 respectively. So VQFX1 would receive the final BPDU, the configuration BPDU. It would also agree that VQFX5 has the lowest bridge ID and its cost to reach that root bridge would be 2,000 plus 2,000 plus 2,000 would be 6,000. And at that point, VQFX5 would be the root bridge. Now, in the previous examples, we've said, well, what if we want to explicitly name VQFX2 should be the root bridge? All we would have to do is adjust the priority down. The priority takes precedent first. So if VQFX2 had a priority of, say, 4,094, then its MAC address, it would immediately become the root bridge for the entire environment. And then all of the subsequent configurations that are trying to happen here for VQFX3, 4, and 5 would be trying to build their fastest path back to VQFX2 and then blocking on subsequent ports. And this is how easy it is to actually configure VQFX2 to be the root bridge on a Juniper device. I've brought up the console of VQFX2 and let's first verify where the root bridge is. I'll say show spanning tree bridge detail and I'll press enter. So immediately we can see, let's look at the local parameters first. First of all, the format of the bridge ID. Here's our priority, all set to 32,678. And here is our bridge ID. We already identified that VQFX5 with that 11 right there is going to be the root bridge. And sure enough, that's who it sees the root ID is. And again, keep in mind, if I just bring the screen down for one moment, VQFX2 had one, two hops to go. And on 10 gig, 10 gig interfaces, that cost was 4,000. So if I now want the entire topology to see VQFX2 as the root bridge, I'll go into configuration mode and I will set the protocols of RSTP to have a bridge priority of 4K. On Juniper devices, you could explicitly write it out in the increment of 4,094, or you could just put a K on it. You could say 40K or 44K or 28K, and that would absolutely work. So I'll say set that and then commit and quit. And at this point, our VQFX2 device would start sending out a new configuration BPDU, letting all of the other devices know that it now believes that it should be the root bridge because it has the best priority. So if I say show spanning tree bridge detail one more time, sure enough, now the root bridge sees ourselves as the root. Here is the priority and things like the cost in the root port are removed from the output of show spanning tree root bridge detail. Now, if I jump back to VQFX5 real quick, let's do show spanning tree bridge detail. And this device now believes that VQFX2 is the root bridge based on that priority. And sure enough, it is still two hops away and it has a cost of 4,000. So this is good. Now we understand who has been elected the root bridge. It really comes down to that priority and that MAC address. And we understand that VQFX2, because we manually set the priority, it's now our root bridge. So what happened with all of the other interfaces? The first thing is when these devices figure out that they're not the root bridge, they now have to figure out what is the quickest way that they could get to the root bridge. When VQFX2 sends out its configuration BPDU down this link, it not only says I'm the root bridge, but it also says here's my cost to reach the root bridge. And since it is the root bridge, its cost is zero. So VQFX4 will receive a BPDU from VQFX2 with a cost of zero. And it will believe that this port is the closest port to the root bridge, and it will set that as the root port. Think about it this way as well. If VQFX2 sent a BPDU to VQFX3, and then VQFX3 sent that BPDU towards VQFX4, it would be receiving a BPDU that says a cost of 2,000. So its comparison is, I have a cost of 2,000 to reach the root bridge, or I have a cost of zero to reach the root bridge. And it believes that the cost of zero is going to be the best way to reach the root bridge. And therefore it says that this port will be my root port. So the next flip side of that, is VQFX2 will send that BPDU with a cost of zero this way. 
and VQFX3 would believe that its best port is XE001, and that would be the root port. That would be as opposed to VQFX1 or VQFX4, which would both be advertising a cost of 2000. So if I'm cleaning up the screen, we've got a root port here, we've got a root port here, and you could probably guess that this would be a root port over here. But let's pretend for one moment that we inserted a switch right here and then ran trunk links down to VQFX5 this way. When VQFX5 needs to select its root port, it will receive a BPDU coming from VQFX4 with a cost of 2000, and it would also receive a BPDU coming from our new switch with a cost of 2000. So in this case, cost alone or is not enough for VQFX5 to determine how it should get to the, the root bridge. So the next tiebreaker in selecting who its root port should be would be the bridge ID. It would go based on priority first and then MAC address again. So if VQFX4 had a lower priority or a lower MAC address, VQFX5 would block the port to our new switch. So it is worth pointing out that cost alone might not be the best way to, for our devices to select a root port if it still has two equal cost paths to reach the root bridge. So let me clean up the screen a little bit now that we've talked about that scenario. And we'll talk about now how does VQFX5 select its root port. VQFX2 advertises down to VQFX4 and then VQFX4 is going to advertise out both of these ports as long as LACP hasn't been configured. We have two 10 gig switch ports, but there's no bundle actually in place right now. So at this point, VQFX5 receives two BPDUs, one on 10 gig 003 and one on 10 gig 004. And because these are both 10 gig interfaces, both PDUs have a cost of 2000. And because both of these BPDUs came from VQFX4, they have the same bridge ID. So the tiebreaker in this case, when we have redundant uplinks going to the same switch, is it goes based on the sender's, keyword there, sender's port priority or ID. Just like we can configure a priority on the bridge ID itself, we can also configure a priority on the interfaces themselves. Now I actually explicitly put 10 gig 004 here connected to 10 gig 003 and vice versa, just to highlight the fact that this is going based on the sender's address. If we don't adjust the port priorities, all the default port priorities on Juniper devices will be 128. If I were to set one of these to be a lower priority, it would like 127, then this interface would be the winner. But if I leave the port priorities to be 128 on both sides, then it would literally go down to the sender's lowest interface ID. So since the sender is VQFX4, the lowest interface ID would be 10 gig 003. So VQFX5 would block its 10 gig 003 and the root port would be 10 gig 004 going out towards this 10 gig 003. That sender's MAC address thing, that sender's port priority and prior and interface ID, that will really throw you for a loop the first time you do it, but that is how it absolutely works. So now at this point, we have all of our root ports in place. What now happens with all of our other links? like between VQFX3 and between VQFX1. In this case, one of these switches is going to keep its interface up and the other switch is going to keep its interface down. Another way that I've heard this put, particularly by Keith Barker, is it's okay for a switch to send traffic away from the root bridge like so, but one of these devices has to block it in order to actually prevent a switching loop. So let's take a look at this from the perspective of VQFX4 and VQFX3 here it works almost identically to the selection of the root ports. The first tiebreaker in this case is going to be the cost to reach the root bridge. So from the perspective of VQFX4, its cost to reach the root bridge is 2000. And from the perspective of VQFX3, its cost to reach the root bridge is 2000. So we don't have a tiebreaker immediately out of the gate. We have equal costs that we're sharing back and forth through the usage of BPDUs. So the next thing that would come up would be the actual bridge ID itself. If we don't configure the priority one more time, then the default priority on each of these devices is 32,678. Let me put a little comma there a little bit better. So then what we have to do is inspect the MAC addresses themselves. VQFX4 right here has the lower MAC address of 4C as opposed to C7. So VQFX4 wins the tiebreaker here and it becomes 
the designated bridge, and the link that we're trying to configure here falls out like so. From VQFX Force perspective, 10 gig 000 becomes the designated port, and VQFX3 becomes the blocking port. Similarly, we'll look at VQFX1 between VQFX3. Again, they both have a cost of 2,000, and they both have a priority of 32,678, so the tiebreaker comes down to VQFX1 or VQFX3. Looking at this little 16-bit section here, 9C beats out C7 one more time, so VQFX3 will end up blocking here, and VQFX1 will have the designated port. So now when host 11 wants to ping host 12, we have clearly given it a path forward. It would go through here, then down here, then over this bottom interface and out. Return traffic would follow the exact same path. It does feel a little chaotic and fuzzy at first. Watch this nugget as many times as you need to, but really remember that there's four key steps that are happening here. We're electing the root bridge. We find out our root port. We find out our designated port and the remainders go into the blocking state. It really all comes down to priorities and MAC addresses too. The lowest one always wins, and then you can explicitly configure the priorities on either the bridges or the interfaces themselves. That way you can settle the tiebreakers and manually manipulate your own spanning tree environment. So this has been how spanning tree does what spanning tree does. In the next nugget, we'll take a look at some of the variations of spanning tree, talking about how RSTP changes some of the terminology a little bit. In the meantime, I hope this has been informative for you, and I'd like to thank you for viewing.